Wes Anderson has a unique and recognisable aesthetic. While some view his style as superficial and lacking substance, others praise Anderson's warmth and humanity seen from a wickedly humorous perspective that is at the same time compassionate. The word quirky has been used often to describe his work, and a particular brand of American film. Anderson's style has continued throughout his career, so his films are a suitable example to demonstrate the characteristics of quirkiness and its implications. So what does this seemingly vague term mean? In his essay notes on quirky, James McDowell describes it as a sensibility, arguably out of convenience due to the vague nature of the concept. It is a term that could be used dubiously, but McDowell argues that the sensibility can be identified demonstrably. Jeff King writes, It might be a matter of slightly unusual juxtapositions, combinations or variations, either of characters, objects, events, or in various aspects of audiovisual form. A quirky narrative structure, therefore, might be one that departs slightly oddly rather than radically from what is usually expected in the classical Hollywood mainstream variety. It is a non-controversial strangeness that does not alienate a broad audience through a radical or surreal departure from convention. Quirkiness is achieved in part through tone, or the perspective it takes to its characters, world and conventions and the corresponding relationship that this perspective encourages between film and viewer. So to explore the conventions that lead to the quirky sensibility, I must closely analyse representative examples from Wes Anderson's filmography that display the sensibility as defined by McDowell and other critics. Through my analysis, I will attempt to discern quirkiness as a cultural trend relating to recent attitudes towards irony and postmodernism. In 2002, Jeffrey Sconce identified the Smart Film, a breed of postmodern American independent cinema that adopted irony, black humour, fatalism, relativism and nihilism. He listed Spike Jones, Todd Salons and Alexander Payne as examples of directors in this ilk, along with Wes Anderson himself. <laughs> we... We're in love! <laughs> Sconce saw that, although the films embrace more classical narrative structures than the art film, they achieve this ironic perspective through tone. McDowell cites Sconce's work, but notes a development from the smart film in his description of quirky cinema. This is mainly in the quirky sensibilities movement away from irony and towards sincerity. Anderson undoubtedly balances the ironic with the sincere, leading to Bogdanovich's description of his humanity from a wickedly humorous perspective. The smart film has a blank style, due to the use of long shots, static composition and sparse cutting, as well as tableau style shots from 90 and 180 degree angles. Sconce claims this signifies dispassion, disengagement and disinterest, leading to a sense of clinical observation and ironic detachment for the viewer. Wes Anderson's cinematography clearly has the blank style, his aesthetic being associated with symmetry and flat angles. This is accompanied with a neat meticulousness that McDowell describes as characteristic of the quirky. Often in a Wes Anderson film, characters will face the camera directly. I'm looking for Sarah Jax. This example from the Grand Budapest Hotel arguably draws the viewer into the characters and their perspective. However, it implies a self-consciousness that King relates to artificiality. Like the smart film, quirky cinematography draws attention to itself as a formal construct and thus draws attention to the artist. This could partly explain Wes Anderson's success as a uniquely distinct filmmaker. However, the blank style doesn't always cause viewer disengagement. It also reflects narrative, an example being The Life Aquatic with Steve Zissou. Zissou is a documentary filmmaker and has difficulties sincerely engaging with his life. See, Renzo, this is what I'm talking about, a relationship subplot. There's chemistry between us, you know? Huh? The ironic detachment of the cinematography expresses his detachment and his difficulty being sincere, as he himself puts it to his son, Ned. It's just... I want to communicate my feelings to you. But... I think I might start to cry. This relationship between the dampened effect of the cinematography and the detached characters is common in Anderson's films, but this doesn't completely explain the visual style, as it also serves to incongruously flatten and in the process make dryly comic a situation that could easily be treated as deeply dramatic. Thus, another aspect of quirkiness is its relation to comedy. Watch this scene from The Life Aquatic with Steve Zissou. Come on. One, two, three. Ned nearly dies, but the scene is incongruous, as a moment that could be played for drama is instead made comic. McDowell calls this dampened execution, or drain the expected emotions from the potentially melodramatic. 
This is fused with a comedy of emotional pain or embarrassment, such as this moment from Rushmore. It's too late. Oops. Wait, please. Our response here is to laugh out of embarrassment, although we care about Max and empathise with him in his situation. Both these types of comedy are emotional, but withdrawn from the emotion due to their execution. In the Rushmore example, the comedy also comes from the physicality of the performances, leading to the third type of comedy McDowell outlines, slapstick. Slapstick is common in Wes Anderson's work, and is funny due to the tension between physical pain and a context where it is inconsequential to the narrative. All film violence is inconsequential to the viewer, but not always to the narrative. Tone is what allows this pain to be funny. McDowell writes, We see the fiction as simultaneously absurd and moving, the characters as pathetic and likeable, the world as manifestly artificial and believable. The tensions outlined here all contribute to tone. Another aspect of Anderson's style, and one that's highlighted by McDowell as typical of quirky cinema, is its association with innocence and children. Anderson's films follow young protagonists, display a nostalgic imagery and explore the correlations in the behaviour of adults and children. A theme of Rushmore is the similarity between Herman, played by Bill Murray, and Max in their competing quests to win the heart of Max's teacher, Rosemary. Love, in its universal significance, is the link between old and young. But the young experience these emotions more intensely. Talking about Moonrise Kingdom, Anderson says, A 12 year old with a crush is that's really the whole world uh, for that person. McDowell highlights that innocence is the least compulsory characteristic of quirky films, but it is clearly common in Anderson's work. So why does it all matter? What are the implications of quirkiness? The quirky film has been described as post-postmodernist or post-ironic. The return of sincerity has superseded the detached, fatalistic, smart films that Sconce identifies. Instead, the films invoke optimism and belief in progress, more modernist, conformist values, along with the postmodernist, ironic detachment as a result of a belief in relativism and plurality. The shift to more modernist values is exemplified in the family reunification in Anderson's The Royal Tenenbaums. Anderson has been compared with the New Sincerity, a primarily literary movement closely associated with the work of David Foster Wallace. Wallace wrote, Few artists dare to try to talk about ways of working toward redeeming what's wrong because they'll look sentimental and naive to all the wary ironists. Irony's gone from liberating to enslaving. So according to Wallace, sincerity, even naive sentimentality, will always be more redeeming than distant irony.